from Georgia Tech, but before that did his PhD here at the University of Michigan in computer science, uh, where you're advised by Ellen Salway. Yes. Uh, he's an ACM fellow. You have a distinguished ACM teaching award for undergraduates, and I'm probably missing the, and a bunch of other awards as well. Uh, so yeah, please welcome Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let me explain a little bit about the context for this talk. Uh, I was in a meeting with Robin. She was saying we wanted to have more internal speakers in this. And I said, I'm giving a keynote on March 1st of 1,300 people. I would love to have an extra chance to practice. She said, great. So that's how I'm ending up here. So please imagine that you are all ACM SIG C members, members of uh, SIG in computer science education. There's about 1,300 of you, and I'm really scared in front of the room. And so that's the context of this talk. When I was a graduate student, my uh, advisor, Elias Soloway, made all of his students read this book, Cultures by C.P. Snow. Um, if you're not familiar with it, C.P. Snow was a scientific advisor to the UK government during World War II. Um, and he wrote this book because he bemoaned that he saw the humanity side of the world, and what we now see as the STEM side of the world, two cultures in Western society, not really communicating that decisions were being made for technical reasons without considering the human humanitarian perspective. People were making a humanities perspective without really understanding the science. Um, he blamed this all on the humanities folks, but we're not going to go there. Elliot didn't have us read this because he was particularly annoyed at the humanities folks. He had us read this to think about the question, who needs or could use what we have to offer who's not even going to come into the room because they see themselves as being part of a different culture. So, this is the mission statement of the ACM Special Interest Group and Computer Science Education. I really love it. I think it is a really noble statement. And thinking <coughs> about what the implications of this are, and what does it mean to provide a forum for computing educators at all education levels. That's, that's really what the, most of this talk is about today. So here's the story that I want to tell you about. Um, first, that computer science was actually invented to teach everybody about computing. Really, that's why the term was invented in the first place. Um, then I want to tell you a little bit about what computational thinking might imply for how we teach everybody with computing and the power of the imitation game. And then we're going to give you a couple of examples about what does it mean to teach computing for helping everybody learn, for helping for improving thinking. So let me give you some definitions first. Um, my favorite definition of computer science is the one that uh, Alan Perlis, Alan Newell, and Herb Simon developed in 1967 in a letter to a Science Magazine. It's the study of computers and all the phenomena associated with them. For some of you that you might want a little bit narrower one, that's fine. I'm hopefully able to try to convince you that this is a good definition, that this is actually the broad one that we want. Computing is a different kind of a thing. It's meant to be an umbrella across software engineering, information systems, information technology, uh, a whole bunch of other things. Um, it's about computing facing outward. That's what Peter Denning came up with. Programming is reading and writing a, a notation for computation, the specification of computer's process. And what that means, the implications of that, that it's, that it's actually, you know, the words while and else don't appear there. It doesn't have to have curly braces. That's the, the kind of idea that I want to try to get across. This is George Forsyth, a mathematician at Stanford, who invented the term computer science in 1961. Interestingly, he first used the term computer science in the Journal of Engineering Education. He explicitly came up with computer science because he saw that computer science was one of the most valuable tools in STEM education, that it was the third leg of STEM literacy. He wrote that the most valuable parts of a STEM education are, quote, the general purpose mental tools which remain serviceable for a lifetime. I rate natural language and mathematics as the most important of these tools, and computer science as the third. Computer science was explicitly invented to be alongside mathematics and language as a tool for thought. Computers in the World of Future was a seminar held at the MIT Sloan School in 1961. Um, it was meant to be a who's who of computer science. Gene Omdahl, John McCarthy, Alan Newell, Herb Simon, Grace Hopper. This book by uh, Martin Greenberger came out in 1962, and it was a transcript of all the lectures and all the discussions, comments. I want to talk about one in particular. Um, uh, the Computer in the University was the lecture by Alan Perlis. If you're not familiar with Alan Perlis, Alan Perlis started the computer science departments at both Yale and Carnegie Tech. 
and he was the winner of the first ACM Turing Award, sort of the, tour of the Nobel Prize of computer science. So Perlis made the argument that everybody on every university should take a class in computer science, and explicitly they should all learn how to program. And his argument was, was, was made as a contrast with calculus. In general, we think that everybody, in general, calculus is part of a general education. If you're really well educated, you know some calculus. He says, that's fine, that calculus is the study of rates. Computer science is the study of process, and everybody cares about process. And what the computer gives us is automated execution of process. An automated execution of process changes the way you think about your world. So what he talked about was that the, the, the business department at Carnegie Tech was starting to run economic simulations. Before this, economics was not an experimental science. Hey, let's devalue the dollar tomorrow just to see what happens. Right? But once you can run simulations, economics becomes an experimental science. It changes the way that you think about the things that you knew before. When we think about computing as a tool for anybody, as a tool for thinking with, we often think of this guy, Seymour Papert. Seymour Papert claimed that children can learn to program, and learning to program can affect the way that they learn everything else. He wasn't interested in teaching computer science for its own sake, and certainly not to give people better jobs. He wanted people to learn computer science because it gave them a new way of seeing their own world, a new way of understanding new things. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, Gary Steger on the right gave, gave me this picture. Uh, this includes uh, Wally Furzig on the left, who's the actual inventor of Logo. Uh, Seymour was a consultant on the project and invented the turtle. And he worked with Cynthia Solomon in the middle on the development of the Logo turtle and the curriculum that they built. This is where I first learned about this whole story that I've laid, laid out for you. Um, Alan Kay and Adele Goldberg wrote the paper Personal Dynamic Media, uh, which I first read in 1982. And I love this idea that they spelled out. The idea is that computing should be a tool, it should be a meta medium, it should be a medium for anything, it's a tool for thinking. That on the computer we can represent illustrations and text and music and diagrams. <coughs> if you're not familiar with the picture on the left, this is Smalltalk 76. It is not a version of Microsoft Windows. This is actually the very first screenshot we have of the desktop user interface. The desktop user interface was invented by Alan and Adele's group at Xerox Park as a way of realizing this vision. How should you use the computer such that it becomes a tool for thought? And in, in so doing, they develop the desktop user interface. So Alan wrote, the computer literacy is a contact with the activity deep enough to make the computational equivalent of reading and writing fluent and enjoyable. There are people who study reading and writing. That's their whole focus. They study English composition. They study literature. There are people who will study computer science. But most of us use reading and writing in an everyday sense as a way of learning, as a way of expressing ourselves, as a way of communicating. That's what the ideal was for computing. That's why Alan and his team invented the idea of the desktop user interface. Andy DeSessa invented the term computational literacy. And he invented a programming environment, Boxer, that was meant to be where kids would start from kindergarten all the way up through adults and use, the computing as a, use computing as a way of thinking, as a way of expressing themselves, as a way of sharing ideas. Um, he and his students did what, for me, is some of the most fundamental work on thinking about what is computational literacy. So Bruce Sharon did this wonderful work that helped us understand why code is different than learning with equations. I'm going to bet that most of you in this room have seen this equation at some point. You may have been trying to forget about it. I'm sorry for giving any bad memories. Um, this is the, the equation that explains the current position of, a sub, of an object is based on its initial position plus velocity times time plus one half times acceleration times time squared. When you learn something with an equation, you learn about a sense of balance. If I give you all of the variables but one, you can solve for the other one because this whole equation balances. Bruce taught the same thing using this code in Boxer. Um, what's going on inside the box, it's really not that complicated. You, every, for every tick of the clock, we change the velocity by the acceleration. We change the position based on the velocity. We move the object, whatever its, its new position is, and make a dot. And that gives us the falling object on the left. So I did something similar for my dissertation work here at the University of Michigan. And then when I ask a student, after they work with this kind of thing, you're at the top of a two-story building, and you drop a rock. How long does it take to hit the ground? And I had this. The, uh, the, this, this is the, the dialogue that I have with the student. 
Let's scan it quick, and what you see is there's no X's, no V's, no A's, no T's. He's not solving the equation. Now, if you start noticing the words that are appearing in his, in his description, he's running a four loop. He's running second by second in his mind. He's got a causal model of how each second, acceleration and velocity and time, relate. And that's how he's able to figure out how long it takes. Notice he comes up with an estimate. It goes one, two, no, before two. One and a half. So the powerful idea here is that computation is a causal specification of process that can be automated. It's a way of, uh, it's, a, it's a tool for thinking about the world. It can affect the way that we do everything else. And the goal is enjoyable fluency. Um, I think the really powerful idea here is captured by this movie. Uh, show of hands, how many people saw the Imitation Game? Okay, if you didn't, it's a story of Alan Turing. Um, the Imitation Game is talking about his life, but it's also, for all the computer scientists, a little bit of a, of a side reference to what Turing actually did. Turing, the, Turing defined the Universal Turing Machine, a definition of computing. And the cool thing about the Universal Turing Machine is that it can simulate anything. The whole idea was to capture all of mathematics. Any universal Turing machine can represent, can simulate any other machine. Alan wrote, Alan K. wrote in 1999, 1991, the computer is the greatest piano ever invented, for it is the master carrier of representations of every kind. The heart of computing is building a dynamic model of an idea through simulation. So the idea is that computer science was explicitly created for this idea of being a tool for teaching anything because it can represent anything. And because it's automated execution of process, it's amazingly powerful. So let me get a little bit deeper into that. So Sixie has taken on this challenge of making this computing education idea available to everybody, being a global forum for computing educators who are doing this at all educational levels. Computing education for everybody. So let me lay out the timeline that I've given you so far. 1961, George Forsyth invents the term. Alan Perlis explicitly makes the argument that it's for everybody. In 1967, Forsyth made this argument that it's the third leg of STEM literacy. 1968, the first computer science curriculum was developed and SIGSI started. So here we are 50 years later. The question is, do we have computational literacy for all? In Scotland, the number of computer science teachers is declining. And if we look by region in Scotland, what we see is that there's still a lot of regions in Scotland on the left that 0% of their schools do not have a computer science teacher. But on the right, you see that some of the districts are up to 16, 70% have no computer science teachers at all because they're losing computer science teachers as opposed to gaining them. In the United Kingdom, if you're familiar, they have general qualifiers and they have A-levels. Uh, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you can think of these as being uh, owls and newts. Um, everybody has to take a certain number of general qualifiers and to get sort of college credit, AP kind of credit, you do A-levels as well. In the UK, 53% of schools offer the computer science general qualification, but only 12% take it, and less than 2% of those are female. The A-levels are offered by 36% of UK schools, but under 3% take it, and less than 10% of those are female. Now in the United States, we're finding that very few students are taking computer science. While the number of schools offering computer science is growing, the number of students who take up that offer is pretty small. And it's mostly male, especially in the advanced placement classes. So I'm only going to present data from a couple of states. If people aren't familiar, in the United States, every state has its own K-12 education system. And we don't have very much federal data. Uh, so in Indiana, less than 30% of the Indiana high schools offer computer science, and the most popular course they have only has 0.5% of the students enrolled in it. In Georgia, 47% of schools now offer computer science. 43%, as best we can tell, have never offered computer science. And less than 1% of Georgia students take any computer science. So this is a fairly complicated visualization, but hang with me, it's really cool. Barbara developed this based on last year's AP computer science data. Um, actually, all AP data. This is a number of the advanced placement exams. They're listed uh, vertically. Um, the size of the dot is how many people take that AP exam. So as you can see, you know, the really big ones are things like English language and composition. The middle is where the number of female test takers equals the number of male test takers. What you see is that for most AP exams that are listed here, they're female majority. Okay? Way down the left-hand corner, 
There's computer science. The very most leftmost is AP Computer Science Level A. Slightly more to the right is AP Computer Science Principles. CS Principles is much more female than APSA. But then look at that gap down to Physics 1. And then here's the really scary thing. This is a log scale. That's a really big gap between computer science and everything else. So consider the scale of what we have here. AP Computer Science A had 66,000 exam takers in 2018. AP CS Principles at 70. 76K. Compare that to English literature at 580K and AP Calculus at 305K. And then think about the fact that there are 15.1 million high school students in the United States. It is very likely that 90% of kids in computer, in high school kids in the United States never see any computer science at all. Okay, so let me get back to our timeline. 61, computer science, 67. It should go out for everybody. 68, 60, um, here we are 50 years later. I don't think we're there yet. When would we achieve computational literacy for everyone? So I think we've got some really great examples that are coming up. Uh, Bootstrap Algebra, amazing program which teaches kids algebra by having them build video games, essentially, uh, using programming. Uh, CT Stem at Northwestern is teaching science using computer science. We see that end user programming is growing. There is evidence that suggests that for every professional software developer in the world, there are four to nine more people who are not professional software developers, but program because it's really useful to them, because it's something that's useful in their lives. This is what Forsyth wanted. Computer science is the third leg. It's just part of your literacy. It's part of the way that you do things. Today we have this notion of computational thinking. It was originally invented by Seymour Papert. It appears in his book, Mindstorms, about 1980. It's been popularized by Jeanette Wing. She makes the argument that knowing computer science will allow you to make better decisions like which line you get in in the grocery store and how you should pack your backpack in the morning. I don't think that most of us believe that that works like that anymore. But I think the really powerful idea is to think about computation for thinking as opposed to computational thinking. So here's the definition, an operational definition of computational thinking. This comes from ISTE and CSTA. These are both two teacher groups. You don't have to read it all. Let me just summarize it for you in terms of these skills. What I'm going to argue that computational thinking is about, I'm just pulling phrases out, specification of problems, use automation, organize and analyze data, represent data, use models and simulations, explore a range of solutions, efficiency and effectiveness in problem solving. So, all I need you to believe at this point is that we could actually teach this. That we could actually use computing to teach people these skills in a computational thinking computer science setting. All right? So you accept that for just a minute. This is the definition of engineering thinking from the Royal Academy of Engineering. They said that engineering thinking is about making things that work and making things work better. And if we take a look, this is their, their list of their habits of mind, what an engineering thinking means. And if we start looking through these, we see a lot of the same phrases that we see in the computational thinking idea. I think we can summarize this with some of the same boxes that we just did from computational thinking. That engineering thinking means specification of problems, organizing and analyzing data, representing data, using models and simulations, supporting a range of solutions, efficiency and effectiveness in problem solving. Next generation science standards offered scientific thinking. I'm going to use a definition of scientific, scientific thinking that came from Krajic and Merrick in 2012. Again, if we take a look at this list, we're going to see a lot of the same things that we saw previously. I think I can summarize these with some of the same boxes that I used originally in computational thinking. In the work that I'm doing at the University of Michigan, I'm working a lot with history professors and thinking about how computation could make their jobs easier, make people learn history better. Turns out, historical thinking, it's a thing. You can Google it. Um, and they describe that historical thinking has these components to it, which will look a lot like these. And it's about specification of a problem. It's about organizing and analyzing data. It's about representing data, using models and simulations, exploring a range of solutions. If we can teach CT, we can teach computational thinking, we should also be able to teach Engineering thinking, scientific thinking, historical thinking. The idea is that computing is then a medium for all of these. It's the idea of the simulation game. Computing can be history, science, engineering, and computation as well. And because it can be a causal model and because it's automated, 
that can help with the learning. And we can build a model that checks itself. We can build a model that does something in the world. It's a model that can actually be more successful in helping people learn. That's my argument that computation is a 21st century. <coughs> it can be a tool for learning all those other kinds of things. So, but guys, now, if we teach computer science in other classes, can we really teach enough? I hear that a lot from computer science teachers. No, no, they need a whole class. I mean, we got to make sure they get filled up with computer science. Um, I am now on day 701 of Duolingo Street trying to learn Spanish. Um, how much of a foreign language do you actually need to learn to be able to communicate? Okay? I mean, becoming fluid is something different. And can't you always learn more? Isn't there always more that you can learn about a, a particular language? So I am really, um, really inspired by this work uh, that Katie Rich and her colleagues wrote in 2017 where they asked the question, what's the starting place? What does everybody have to learn about computing as a stepping stone to learning programming? And they developed these really wonderful learning trajectories about what is it. Now, they originally wrote these for K through 8, but I'm pretty darn sure that everybody who learns to program has to learn these things. Here are some of their very first things that they suggest everybody has to learn. That precision and completeness are important when writing instructions. A different set of instructions can produce the same outcome. Don't these look like things that everybody has to learn if you're going to learn how to program? What's more is, um, we never teach these in intro computer science. We just sort of figure, you'll figure these things out. Now, the other pushback that I get when I talk about this is people, you know, computer science teachers say, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's the bare minimum. That's day one. You need to know so much more to be successful. I don't know. Scratch, a programming language that is used in K through 12 by 30 million users. All right? They don't use all of that list. There's this wonderful study by Yasmin Kafai and Debbie Fields. Uh, there's several of these, but th that's one of my favorites. When I looked at what kids actually do in Scratch, they only use forever loops. They don't use Booleans. They don't have whiles or, or repeat untils. Um, they just do movement sequence. 30 million people find this to be an expressive medium, something they feel that they develop fluency in. And it doesn't even cover that whole list that I just showed you. Or let's consider Bootstrap. Bootstrap doesn't use all of that list. There are no loops when these kids are learning uh, algebra programming. They're lear learning algebra through programming video games. Um, it improves learning in algebra. Now, they add things that aren't in the list, like they have functions because they're doing functional programming, functions without side effects. But look at the middle column of that table from their 2015 paper. There's not a whole lot of computer science there. And yet, they're able to improve students' learning in algebra. There's a, a powerful learning power in even a subset of computer science. So, given that, I'd like to give you a couple of examples of what it would look like if we taught computer science for this bigger goal of, of, of changing the way that people think of giving, using computing as a way of coming to understand ideas. Um, so the first one, I'd like you to pretend that you are freshmen in my intro computer science media computation class and I'm going to teach you how digital sound works. Okay, so right now my vocal cords are bouncing against air molecules. Air molecules are elastic, so they bump together and then they come back out again. And we can measure the air pressure. There's an increase in air pressure as the air molecules compress, and then they bump apart and there's a decrease in air pressure, and then it comes back to normal. The height of the wave is the amplitude, the volume, how loud something is, and how often it goes up and down, that's the frequency, cycles per second. Uh, a above middle C is 440,000. Uh, 440 cycles per second. And if you're anything like my, um, my, my freshman, you're all asleep by now. So let me show this to you in a different way. Okay, so this is using a programming language called GP. It's a block space programming language, which is fast enough that I can do this kind of visualization. Um, we are looking at the speaker, the, the, the audio pressure as it hits the microphone of my laptop at this very moment. higher pitch, lower volume, fatter waves, fatter pitch, or lower pitch. Okay, let me show this to you in a slightly different way. 
This is now doing a fast Fourier transform. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. I don't either. But I know how to demonstrate it. Frequency increases from left to right, and the height is the amount of energy at that particular frequency. So all natural sounds, like my voice right now, is actually composed of a lot of sine waves, a lot of different frequencies all together. Some sounds, like a whistle, this is a single, a single pitch. Now musical sounds, sounds that sound musical to us, tend to have a fixed set of tones and overtones. Okay? Same thing for musical instruments. Now we can actually synthesize a harmonica sound by simply adding up those sine waves and, and, and playing them out. Let me show you a different kind of musical instrument that's a little bit harder to capture like this. <laughs> So the ukulele still has the same overtones, but it's a little harder to see because they fade. So I'm going to shift to this other view. This is called a sonogram view. Frequency increases from top to bottom. Darkness is the amount of energy at that frequency. Sort of audio etch-a-sketch. Now we can see the overtones really clearly. And we can see them in the ukulele too. Now have a better understanding of how sound works. So sound is this waveform that's going up and down, and up and down, and up and down. On a computer, all we have is a bunch of numbers. How do we get it into the computer? Well, well we can use the stuff you learned in integral calculus that you've been trying to forget for the last 20 years. That we can take small rectangles to capture everything about the wave. Those little rectangles are samples, so basically measure the height of the wave lots and lots of times per second, 20, 40,000 times per second and that allows us to capture the wave. So now a sound is just a long series of numbers. All right. So here, oops. Here is the sound. This is a test. And you can basically, so this is literally graphing the height of the wave. Okay? And so you can see the bumps where this is a, you can see exactly where the four words are. We can put a separation here. Play, be, play before or play after that. This is a test. If you wanted to actually there. Okay, play before. This afterward is a test. Okay, now, so this is just a long series of numbers between positive and negative 32,000. All right? How do we make it bigger then? Here's how we increase the volume. For each sample in the samples of the sound, Multiply it by four to so make the positive values bigger positive, the negative values bigger negative. That'll make the whole wave bigger. So I'm going to increase volume T. If you look at it, it looks bigger. Here's the original one. This is a test. Here's the new one. This is a test. Okay? And, and if you don't believe me, we can always do it a couple more times. You know, let's rewind again, rewind again, score T. And now it's clearly bigger. Original one. This is a test. New one. This is a test. We're getting that, I think that's the technical term for it. Um, it's clipping. It doesn't actually fit inside the, 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 the uh, 32 bits anymore. Okay, so I'm going to go back and get my sound again from scratch. So now we're back to the original form. This is a test. Honest to God story. First time I ever taught this class, a kid in the back of the room says, what if you set all the sample values, every single one of them, to the highest possible value, 32,000? What that actually does is you hear silence. Because we can't hear sound pressure. We hear variations in sound pressures. The sound pressure goes up and down. That's what we can actually hear. So I said, I'll write you a program, because I wanted to see if statements anyway. For each of the samples in the sound, get that value between positive and negative 32,000. And if it's at all positive, make it the greatest possible possible value. 
And if it's at all negative, make it the largest negative value, the absolute value. So let's run this. Maximize T. Explore T. Original sound? This is a test. Before I press this button, think about what we're going to hear. When I ask this question, I get up. Uh, you're going to static, it's going to sound awful. All right, at this point, I'm going to make everybody in the audience, please, answer a question with your thumb. Will we hear the words, this is a test? If you think we will, give me a thumbs up. If you think no way, give me a thumbs down. Everyone in the room, please, please give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down at this time. All right, Julie, you're holding a plate, and I understand. Right. There you go. Thank you very much. Well, now hold it, hold it. You have to have to have it up as I press the button. Look at your thumb. Okay. So you notice some changes there. All right. Why were you able to hear the words, this is a test? Well, one reasonable explanation is, while we've messed with the amplitude as much as you possibly can, I didn't change the frequency at all. It goes up and down, positive and negative, just that often. I didn't actually manage to do that. Now, but... All right, so let me point out four things about this. First of all, why did it make you put the thumb up or down in the air? This is based on work from Eric Mazur, a physics education researcher, that if I don't make you make a prediction, you don't actually have to face the fact that you don't understand something. And two weeks later, you won't remember. Okay? So by making you make a prediction, I improve your learning. Second bit, how many bits per sample do I need to record intelligent speech? If you look at this code, what you'll see is there are only two values left in for each sample. One bit. One bit per sample is all I need to have completely intelligible speech. It's pretty amazing. Pretty cool. You can hide one bit in lots of places. That's how we can embed sounds inside of pictures, and you can't tell that there's a sound embedded inside the picture. Sorry, I got that out of order. That's the one bit. The seven line story is if you take a look at these seven lines of code, they just taught you something about how you understand speech. You understand speech in terms of frequency, not in terms of amplitude. These seven lines of code probably didn't teach you much about computer science, but taught you something about being human. All humans understand speech in terms of frequency. That's what those seven lines of code really teach you. The final one, which I think is very powerful, is that I hope that everybody learned something from what I just showed you. And none of you wrote any of this code. I wrote the code. I demoed the code. The code was an expression of a process. Everybody followed what was going on with the process. But you didn't actually have to write the code for the programming to actually be a useful medium for conveying the idea. So teaching computer science for literacy is a different goal than software development. It requires a different way of thinking about teaching. Example two, self-goal labeling. One of the big challenges that we've known for many, many years um, is that students get confused. You've taught me so many things, I don't know what to use when. How do we convey what the parts of a program are there for? How do we convey the process? So Richard Catcherboat has been thinking about this for a long time, and he's come up with mechanisms called sub-goal labeling. And his student, Warren Marjolu, worked with Richard and I to try these out in computer science. So on the right-hand side is a list of steps that we might give somebody to do this app in App Inventor, to build this program, do these steps. On the left are the same steps, but now I'm going to put in sub-goals. Say, so first you're going to do this, then you're going to do this, then you're going to do this, and here's why. Okay? And we can make videos that do this. screencast to show you how to do something, right? And now here's a new version of it with sub-goal labels. And what we're going to want is a button that has a picture of fortune teller in it, so we'll drag a button over from the basic palette, and under the properties, we'll change the text for the button, clear that up, and set an image for it, so we'll add an image. So I'm hoping that you will agree with me at this point. This is a relatively small change. In the list of steps, we're putting in some headings, in the video, we're putting in some call-out boxes. All right, so Lauren ran this experiment. 
uh, with App Inventor, where she took two groups of students, just from the psychology pool at, at, at Georgia Tech. The experiment was the same for both groups. You saw a video, with or without sub goals, with the list of instructions, and then immediately afterward, did you do what you showed you? Right? Did you understand that? Did you learn something? Go away for a week. Come back. Can you still do what you did a week ago? Now I'm going to show you a second video, but I'm going to then ask you to make a third app that you've received no instruction for. So we've got learning or understanding, retention, and then transfer. Can you now do something new that you haven't done before? Okay. Immediately afterward, the ones that have got sub-goal label attempt more steps and they get more correct. Statistically significant difference. Go away for a week. Come back. There's no difference in the number, it's statistically significant in terms of the number of steps attempted, but that's because the non-sub-goal people are thrashing. They don't know what to do, and so they're dragging lots of blocks out. The ones who have the sub-goal labeling do get it more correct. The transfer task involved building, grabbing one of the tasks was grab a user interface element and associate a variable with it. Sub goal labeling folks could, the other folks could not. It's a pretty dramatic change from a relatively small thing. All we've done is add these sub goal labels. We get improvement in learning, we get improvement in retention, we get improvement in transfer. We have replicated this multiple times. One of the really interesting things is for high school teachers, the effect is twice as large. I don't know why. We've also tested this with textual languages, it works as well. What's really powerful here is that it's about improving the efficiency and effectiveness of computing education. In general, we have a lot of evidence that we can make computing education better. Barbara's been doing this wonderful work with Parsons problems. The Parsons problem is I'm going to give you a piece of code to write, but instead of you making you li write the lines of code, I'm going to give you the lines of code. But they're on essentially refrigerator magnets, and they're scrambled. You put them in the right order. And by the way, some of the refrigerator magnets you don't want. They're the wrong ones. Okay? This is a very, it turns out that Barbara has shown that this can be as effective as writing the code, as effective as debugging the code in terms of learning, and it takes much less time. We've shown that with things like work examples, there's a wonderful research on pair programming. In my own work, the stuff that I was showing with sound is based on media computation where I have students manipulate pixels of the picture and sample of the sound, and we dramatically improve retention. If we really want to get computing education to everybody, we have to think about the efficiency and effectiveness of what we teach. We can do computing education better. So, my timeline. Uh, 61, when are we going to achieve comp computational literacy for all? Let me give you some stats that I think help to frame this question. Last year, the American Society for Engineering and Education just celebrated its 125th anniversary. The National Council of Teachers of Mathematics was formed in 1920, so they're almost 100 years old. The National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, I'm sorry, the American Association of Physics Teachers was formed in 1950. The Computer Science Teachers Association was formed in 2005. All right? I really think that we are probably still going to be arguing about this when SIGC is 100 years old. Those other disciplines have a big leg up. It's going to take us a while to get there. So, call to action. What do we need to do next to go toward this goal? I have two suggestions. Find our allies and grow the community, and invent, mutate, and evolve. So, we have a lot of individuals doing things that we eventually need to grow into an allied community. Let me give you one. This is Amanya Yada, Beth Simon, and Yasmin Kafayi. Three of the few people that I know around in the United States, around the world, who have computer science expertise in a school of education. If we want to grow more computer science teachers, CS education has to be in schools of education. That's just where we grow more teachers. If we want it sustainable, it has to be there. We have great people in CS education like Andy Stefik and Richard Ladder who focus on special needs students in computer science. This is Maya Israel. She's one of the few people that I know in a school of education who's studying what to what can the students with cognitive disabilities learn about computer science and how do we teach them? We need to know about things like that. That, that has to be more than one person. This has to be a whole community of people. These are two of the colleagues that I've been working with in history. This is Tammy Schreiner and Bob Bain. As people in math, science, social science, humanities start using computer science, they need a community to talk to their stuff about. At first, their own community might not recognize, oh yeah, this is really valuable. If we're going to provide a global forum to computing educators at all levels, we need to think about supporting these folks if they start exploring this as a, as a form of literacy. Okay. Take a look at this device. 
and come up with your guess as to what it is. I won't do this in the chemo, it's not a small group here. Any guesses? What is this? Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing that you can play um, a piece of music and it records what you play on a tape, so you can also play it back. Very close. This is a telegraph machine. Okay, um, 1860. So he, uh, I saw this in the London Science Museum, and I took a picture because it's, it's, a, it's such a wonderful anachronism. I mean, not that it's a telegraph machine, of course, but telegraph machines look like telegraph. Why does this one look so weird? It's got this weird keyboard on it. You thought it was about music. So here's the really interesting idea. The first printing machines for telegraph started around 1840. 40 was not patented until 1868. For almost 30 years, if you had the brilliant idea of pressing a key to generate a letter, well, isn't that the kind of keyboard that you would expect to use? This is the common keyboard. We don't have typewriter keyboards yet. This is the way that you think about it. So for 30 years, this was the common keyboard. What if we're in the same period of computing? Computing is only 50 years old. What if we don't yet have the powerful ideas that will make computing education accessible? What if we're still in the anachronism phase? We need to think about what is our QWERTY keyboard? What makes computing accessible to more people? And lots of people tell me, you know, we can do a lot better than QWERTY. Great. What are the ideas that can make computing education even more accessible? So I think we need to think about new tools, new languages, new curricula, new connections. But not just replicate, we need to evolve. In software engineering, we knew that visual programming languages had failed. Well, until they didn't. So Scratch came along, and drag and drop visual programming languages became the thing that 30 million people around the world use on a regular basis. I think there's lots of ideas that we've passed by in computer science that could actually be super useful in a lot of different disciplines. I've been thinking about logic-based programming for my, my history colleagues. They care about causal chains. Well, that's what logic programming is, is, is all about. So what we have today has been built for very few. We need to think about building things that, for, that involve everybody. So, I have lots of collaborators on this work. Obviously, Barbara's the, the top of the list. Katie's here. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Uh, so, yeah, so I, I re thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and one thing I, I wanted to to hear a little bit more about what you alluded to when you talked about uh, the motivation for learning programming in terms of software development, right? So I think there are at least two cases that you can make for computational literacy. One is that you can learn through this kind of procedural or computational uh, explanation of things, but another, uh, another reason that some people might say that people need computational literacy is that you know everything's going to be digitized and you need to have the ability to write software in order to uh, in order to even deal in that world. So that's more, I think, software development. Everyone needs to write programs, even if, we, if you're a historian, if you're a biologist, et cetera. So I'm wondering <coughs> what you, if you find that other argument kind of for computational literacy to be convincing. Or not. I, I, I think that it's a powerful argument. Uh, I think that's the argument that feeds into end user programming. I mean, there's other models, too. Philip Guo has this wonderful idea. He has some conversational programmers, people who decide that they need to learn programming, not because they love a program, because they're going to talk to programmers, people who suddenly become technical managers. And they need to know something about programming so they can talk to the people that work for them and understand what their tasks are. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons for knowing things about software development. I'm making a slightly different argument. I'm making an argument that scientists think like scientists and engineers think like engineers. And computing can help those things too. In fact, we can help new scientists think like scientists, and new engineers, and new historians think in those ways. Because computing can be a description of those processes too. That's the idea of the computer as the imitation game. The computer is the master simulator. That it can be all of those other things. So yes, computing is useful to know for itself. But what makes it really powerful as a literacy is that I can help you learn the things that matter within your own discipline. You don't even have to come over to the computer science side of the fence. We can come over to your side and help you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I found myself thinking about kinesthetic learning while you were talking. And I think there's uh, 
there's so much pushback on like screen time at this yeah. point. And I think in education, there's a lot of movement towards uh, like getting kids to run out and play and do things as a way of learning. So um, I know that computational thinking is not just sitting at a keyboard; it's often thinking about it different ways. And some of the most memorable, like my AP computer science teacher, had us write down instructions for making a peanut butter sandwich and throw around a ball of yarn to talk about recursion. And then my physics, my AP physics teacher, um, when we were learning about torque, took us out into the school parking lot to change yep. a tire on his car. And I got to be, he That's put like the, 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 I don't remember the name, but I got to be the one who stood on the thing and put my whole weight on it. And he's like, is it moving? And I'm like, nope. And that was how That's I learned about torque. And it's so memorable when you do those things. So I'm not saying that that can't happen when you're writing it in code, but how do you think we can combine those kinds of things so that neither the instructor nor the student are necessarily at a keyboard or a screen, but we're combining these concepts with some of the physics stuff. Maybe like playing ukulele and harmonica in order to teach computer <laughs> science <laughs> ideas. Yeah, no, I, I totally buy in. Um, I forget where I was. There's a science museum that uh, Barbara and I visited. I'm going to blank on where it was. Where as the kids come in the door, it's mostly kids that in the science museum, they give them a starting point and an ending point, and they have to sprint as far as they can. As fast as they can. And then when they get done with that stretch, they can come into this room where they see a scatter plot of everybody who's done that the last 90 times. And if they'd like to start volunteering information, like um, I'm a boy and I'm 12, it will now allow you to start disaggregating that data. Who are the boys on the list? Who are the 12 year olds on the list? I, I love that because it's really about the physicality, but then saying data science is a lens on that. I like to think of computing, just as I was uh, I saying to Steve as a lens, as a literacy, we're doing lots of different things, including things that are in the world. And I am now going to use your idea, and every time that I have to teach the traveling salesman problem, I'm going to give everyone in the class a list of the chores that I need done, <laughs> and they can run all of those errands for me. I love this idea. But yeah, I think that the kinesthetic in your daily lives is certainly amenable to competition. Uh, I'm really interested in your idea for using computer science for history, and this is something that you brought up in your own lab meetings, is that like history is such a complex subject, and with humans, you can't really treat them the way you might treat like an object in a, in a program which has like a very set defined set of attributes. Like, yep. How do you uh, expect to deal with that complexity, and could you say a little bit more about your plans for the future in that area? Um, my plans for the future are literally a bunch of sketches in a notebook right now. Um, but I'm talking to, uh, that's not fair, we, we actually are working on an experiment. Um, Tammy Schreiner at Grand Valley State is teaching a class for the very first time, but is now going to be taught multiple times every semester at, um, to social studies pre-service teachers, so undergraduates, on uh, data literacy for social science education. And we're going to go in in March and bring two tools that are programmable visualization tools. And the reason why two is because I want this to be a participatory design activity. I want some of the teachers in the room to use one of the tools, and the other teachers to use the other tool, and then have a discussion. Which one is better and why? So that I can elicit what do teachers want in their computational tools. In general, I mean, all kudos to Bootstrap and CT STEM and Project Guts. I love that work. But they have always brought the programming language to the table, as opposed to said to the teachers, what do you value? You know, for example, here's a trade-off that I've been, we've been thinking a lot about. We know block-based languages are easier for kids, but they're also pretty inauthentic. A language like Mathematica or R is much more authentic. That's what real data scientists use. But boy, is that complicated. How would teachers deal with this trade-off? Do they care more for the accessibility, or do they care more for the authenticity? And then where's the middle ground? What parts would they want from each? That's the kind of experiment that we're hoping to, that we're planning to run in March um, so that I can start to gather this data. So um, I don't know how to manage the complexity, but I will tell you the, uh, the heuristic that I want to use. I don't want to use computer science techniques for managing complexity. I want to figure out how historians think about complexity and think about ma making the computation work in their terms. I think. And they've been dealing with complexity too. I don't know what their mechanisms are, but that's what I want to build into the tool. Um, and they've told us some of the challenges they have in teaching this kind of content. So in particular, this idea of a long causal chain, this cause, this cause, this cause, this. How do you have kids represent this? And how do you help kids to keep track of, we are not so confident about this link, our evidence is weak here. So that you understand that there's, there might be other explanations for this long causal chain. Um, that's the sort of thing that we're trying to explore right now. 
The, what you had brought up before about um, students with different types of learning challenges or learning disabilities, I'm curious to know in what ways can um, computer science uh, curriculum be adjusted for both young students as well as adult students, for example, um, that might deal with slow processing speed or dyslexia, how, how can that be done? Or is there a way in which uh, computer science um, uh, education can actually be used as a tool to circumvent some of the challenges that these individuals face? Just like operating... Yeah, that's not a small question. Oh. That's, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, wow, so many things. Or um, whatever side you want to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, computing for senior citizens or <coughs> older adults, big area. Um, I don't know that much about it. There's not a whole lot of work that's going on. Some of it's going on here. Um, computing for really young kids, or particular Maya Israel's work for computing for kids with cognitive disabilities and other invisible um, uh, di disabilities. Um, I know that she's been exploring how the issues of things like pacing and the kinds of activities that you can use in the classes. Um, we don't know much about learning outcomes yet. If you change the methods that you teach in order to deal with the kids with special needs, what do they learn from computer science? That's still something that we're, that, we're, that we're learning about and learning to explore. How young can you teach computer science? I know that there are people three, who sit, claim three or four year olds are learning about computer science. I wonder about before you have uh, the ability to abstract, um, if you believe in Piagetian levels, before you reach that, that level of being able to think about abstraction, what are you really learning about when computation is essentially an abstraction of process? Uh, I'm sure that you're learning something, but I don't know if it's the same kinds of concepts that you're going to have later. So, I, in general, when people ask me, what do we know about X uh, in computing education, the correct answer, the default answer is almost always nothing. Um, we're so young at this. Uh, the International Computing Education Research Conference just started in 2005. Um, it's a, we're, we're a young community. The conference has never had more than 200 people at it. Um, and it goes U.S., Australasia, U.S., Europe, U.S. So <laughs> around the world, there's no, certainly no more than a thousand researchers working in this space. And we haven't been at it for very many years. So there's a lot to figure out yet. So I'm uh, trying to figure out the best way to formulate, but uh, this is interesting because I had an argument with my eighth grade son recently who, was, who loves programming, actually. And he was complaining about the hour of code. Yeah. And, uh, and I think there's a couple of things. One, you know, it's an hour, like, <laughs> the entire year. But, uh, but it, when, when you were putting up the AP graph, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking about how it fits in, right? I mean, there's a limited space in the whatever curriculum, K-12 curriculum, right? And there, it, it's all very contentious already. Like, should we yep. continue to have art and music in PE, and those yep. are getting, you know, getting squeezed out? And so making that, I mean, and his argument was, he's like, this is not something everybody needs. Why should everybody need this? Language, you know, English, I get. Science, I get. Math, I get. This is a job skill. You know, he basically was like, so, and I was trying to explain to him, not as articulately as he was like, no, it isn't. It's a way of thinking, you know, and, it, and more and more of other kinds of work are being done this way, and it's, you know, becoming an important thing, but, you know. But that's kind of the attitude that you must be, faced with Absolutely. a lot when talking sure. about this. The people see this as kind of what, what Steve was alluding to as well. I mean, there is an argument around job training. Absolutely. Right, but then that's almost like, well, why aren't we teaching people refrigerator repair in the you know ge general K-12 curriculum? And it gets reduced to that. Yep. I mean, I think if you, you know, clearly if you demonstrate like, oh, it's a better way to teach science, you know, to, you know, then that will kind of break things open. But, so I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this. Um, I guess I'd be interested, first of all, in hearing your thoughts on Hour of Code, and, and second of all, in like, what is the right way to get this into the career? Like, when, if, if, it were, if it were all said and done, you kind of got, we were, it was 2068, we'd solved the problem, where would this fit into the curriculum? Those are both wonderful questions. All right, so the Hour of Code. Um, I agree about the problem of it, of it only being an hour. But you know, so much good has come from the Hour of Code. What is Hour of Code? Yeah. So Code.org um, created, has created, and with their partners, hundreds of these little lessons? I don't know, certainly in the dozens. That, um, and every year during CS Education Week, they make a bunch of these available, and kids and teachers and uh, uh, people around the, around the world are challenged to just spend an hour coding. 
Remember, I just gave you this task. Is the, to my best guess, 90% of all high school kids in the United States never see computer science at all. How about if everybody did an hour of code? Certainly, you can afford an hour. That's the uh, the, the argument. And so, for example, at Ann Arbor, I think they do every grade level in the public schools here does an hour of code, starting with kindergarten, and I assume going to at least through middle school. Uh -huh. The some of the wonderful effects of Our Code is the governor of Arkansas <coughs> saw his grandchild do the Our Code, and that's what convinced him that they needed to have CS education across all of Arkansas. And Arkansas has bought in so big, they have seven full-time computer science specialists in their school of, in the Department of Education to help people around the state adopt computer science. Uh, Carl Lyman was in the Department of Education in Utah, and during CS Ed Week, just had a lunchtime activity. Come do the Hour of Code with me. And that totally changed computer science in Utah. Everyone realized it's something new. So it, I think it has that effect, that it's, it's, a, it's a, a taste, it's a primer, it's a hope. Maybe we should do more of that. Um, my sense, I really agree with the folks like Bootstrap. Most districts, most schools, are not going to be able to afford standalone computer science teachers and standalone computer science right now. I think we're going to have to think about integrated computer science. I don't think going to have to. I think it's a really great idea. I think computer science can be a better way of learning a lot of subjects um, and uh, not necessarily the, the a computational way of thinking. I think computing can help your way of thinking, historical, scientific, engineering. Computing is a powerful tool for expressing these kinds of ideas. Um, so, I, But in 2068, I would love for both. I would love to have computer science integrated in social science, science, mathematics. I want all teachers to have some computer science as they're developing so they can think about how to integrate it into elementary and high school classes. But in the same way that we still have English composition and reading classes, I still want there to be a computer science class to make sure that everybody develops those skills. That would be my wish in 100 years for what it looked like. Or 50 years from now. <laughs> One of the things I hear a lot is like, oh, young people these days use social media and computers so much that they must be, they're so tech savvy. Yeah. And to me, it seems like that's so, yes, that's true. They're comfortable as consumers of technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a huge jump to getting them to think of themselves as creators or to get them to the computational thinking. And, 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 and I think as soon as they see like a line of code, it's just so intimidating. Is. And even if it's just like this For one... For the teachers, even more the students. Yeah, yeah. Well, so what do you think we can do about that aspect of getting over that hurdle of it being so intimidating where they might think, oh, that's really cool, but I can't do it. So um, this is now totally into my, my research space, what I'm trying to do now that I'm here. Okay, so I'm going to both blame and say the answer is, I'm going to use Steve as a representative of the Kai community. <laughs> Okay? Our problem is people have built these great user interfaces, so you don't see any of the computing underneath. You don't see arrays, recursion, iteration, data structures. You don't see any of that. Thus, becoming proficient in all these tools doesn't help you at all with computing. On the other hand, boy, these HCI people, they know how to make things understandable, don't they? What if you don't show people a line of code? What if you show them new forms that are about what they do? I mean, it could be like blocks, but. Um, Show of hands, how many people have ever seen Prolog? Three, four, okay. Prolog is a logic-based programming language. I could tell you that um, John is the father of Tom, and Jack is the father of John. And then tell you, in general, the grandfather of X to Y is where X is the father of A, and A is the father of Y. And now you can figure out the relationships. You can figure out who the grandfather is. Um, it doesn't look, I mean, there it might look like a line of code, but those can actually just be facts and claims. Facts and claims are what history people deal with all the time. It's a computational model. We know how to make logic programming work. Could we help history students and teachers think, use computing as an engine for exploring causal relationships without them ever seeing a line of code? Instead, we simply automate the facts and claims that they actually do as a right part of the regular basis. Um, I'm talking with Pat Herbst in the School of Ed, who is interested in how people learn geometry. And in geometry, they find that kids learn some claim about a pyramid or a cube, and then don't realize it doesn't actually generate so all of them. You just have to get one weird case. All right. Well, what if we have the kid specify their claim as a constraint, and now we generate a dozen of the things that match their constraint, and they can go measure those other things. 
straight-based programming is another model of programming, totally valid, totally works, doesn't have to look like lines of code. 